All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's Tuesday, and we got another edition of the MSP Initiative Live. Uh, our our uh, co-pilot, uh, Kenny P., uh, Ken Patterson from PAX 8, is actually in California at the moment at the CRN uh, Next Gen Conference in Anaheim, I believe. So uh, we said, hey, who can we put in there to you know, fill the very big shoes of Kenny P., and we brought in Layman. Layman, Lamone, Lemon, I get it all. Lamont. I just call him, just call him Gorman. <laughs> <laughs> so we brought we brought in a special guest from Trend Micro. We talked a little bit today about their story and what they're doing in the channel and and why we should actually pay attention there. Uh, because you know, there's always something to be said and, and we're gonna hear whatever that is. Uh, but yeah, let's just, just do some quick housekeeping because you know it's that time. And if I don't get it out of the way now, then I'll forget and you know, at the end of the call, we always get the, hey, was this recorded? And all those other questions. So first things first, this session is being recorded. This and every other session we've ever done since March of 2020, and we all know when that was, uh, is on mspinitiative.com under sessions. So you can literally go, you know, in, in sequential or reverse sequential order, and you can see all of that stuff there. <clears throat> this upcoming uh, November, approximately two weeks from now, we will be in Orlando and maybe a lot of you will be too, right? So if you're headed there uh, for, we all know the conference, IT Nation, uh, we are throwing a community, MSP community block party with a bunch of our friends. Uh, and that's gonna be November 10th from 9 p.m. to 2 a.m. You don't even have to necessarily be going to the conference. If you're in the area and you can stop by, that's good too. So do that and go to this page, scroll all the way down to the bottom, request an invite. And if you're an MSP, we will make sure we get you in there. Um, lastly is our monthly prize giveaways. Again, this is just part of us having some friendly vendors that have joined together to kind of put some prizes out there. So there are 10 prizes every month. Uh, we're in that, you know, time frame right now. So all you need to do is click on giveaways, put your name in the hat, no purchase necessary. And you may win a one of 10 prizes. You literally have nothing to lose. So uh, you don't even have to go and spend money on a lottery ticket. It's literally two seconds of your time. So those are all of the you know usual housekeeping things. Um, so now all of that's out of the way. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna pass the mic over to Mr. Gorman. How about that? See, I flipped it up on him. Uh, how you doing today? Where are you come? Where are you where are you at? And uh, give us a little bit of background about you. How did you sure. get into the technology space, into the channel space? And then we'll talk we'll talk shop. Yeah. So. Layman, Lamon, Lemon, I've gotten it all with my name. Uh, my family calls me LG. Uh, I love to DJ. As you can see, music plays a big piece of my personality. Uh, I love music uh, in general. Been at Trend Micro for the last 13 years. The last 11 of those, been working with MSP partners in some, some way, shape, or form, whether it was in the account management role, technical roles, or now I kind of have the pleasure of looking after the entire service provider channel uh, for our MSP program here at Trend. Um, originally, you know, I'm a psychology major of, of all things. And originally I was going to be a psychometrician. Uh, and then uh, let's just say, <laughs> uh, I didn't want to spend another seven years and maybe $100,000 on top of my first five years and $100,000 on school. And so, I actually jumped into a temp company. Uh, I always loved technology, you know, thought I'd be a coder or at one point before psychology. Uh, and I fell into a temp role within cybersecurity uh, and the rest is history out of college. And so uh, that psychology degree, it comes in handy, but uh, that's kind of how I entered my, uh, my cybersecurity journey was actually through a temp role uh, and uh, yeah, here been at Trend, like I said, 13 years uh, here at Trend. Awesome. Well, 13 years is <clears throat> no small uh, time in technology space. And we all know that things change pretty rapidly. Um, I guess the first question I would ask if I was in a hallway or at the bar, you know, <laughs> like what probably a lot of people are going to be doing here uh, shortly um, at IT Nation or if you're at the Acronis event in Miami or whoever, right? It's usually what we ask, like, Trend is largely thought of as not a channel company, right? Like the people who live in the sand, I call it the sandbox, 
you know, either look at trend as something that shows up on their computer when they buy from Best Buy or something that's really more enterprise in a lot of places like the sandbox that kind of fits in between, right? Like largely not been a trend focus, I guess, or at least perceived to be. So if you're talking to the IT services guy, the managed services guy, why look at trend now? Yeah, no, I, I think you point out something that as the MSP director, if you will, we are a $2 billion security company. We are a behemoth in the security space. We've been there for 30 years. I think that could be good or bad. I say good. It's a testament to the innovation. We know cybersecurity is constantly evolving uh, and morphing and new companies and new technologies every year. So I believe it's a testament to our innovation to be around and relevant in 30 years. And I think what you pointed out is something that I struggle with. I, I wonder, you know, some of the MSPs I talk to, what is it your perception of Trend Micro that A, maybe we're not a channel company, actually 99% of our business comes through the channel, but B, how come we're not necessarily, I think the word I would use in the MSP space, we're not viewed as MSP friendly. And I'm not quite sure why that is, right? Um, we have a big space in leading technologies in what you would say the enterprise space as it relates to cloud security, securing Azure, securing Docker, these next generation technologies, Trend is always leading there first, right? And I think maybe some of that perception that we see in the MSB space is a result of Trend, us. A lot of what we're putting out there is the enterprise, is the cloud stuff, and maybe the MSPs say, well, we're not really talking to you, right? Uh, and I would say that's not necessarily the case, in my opinion. Um, it's just, are the ears open? Are the eyes um, open? Are the ears open to understand technologies and break down perceptions? I think that's the biggest challenge I've had in talking to MSPs is, there's already a built up perception with companies that have been in the industry for a long time. And so before we can have a meaningful conversation, I feel like we have to break down those perceptions. And uh, I agree. You know, MSPs are really keen on that. I call it herd mentality. And mm -hmm. if you're tapped into it, oh, it's a great thing for you. If, it's, if you're not, this is one of the challenges I see in my role is I would love only MSP being talked about at Trend Micro. But that being said, what I would say is it's not reasonable in a $2 billion company, right? Like MSP is a big section, particularly MSP is our focus as it relates to our SMB strategy. We know our MSP partners. So let me, let me, let me, let me throw, let me throw you a question. So everybody has a different uh, definition of what SMB, uh, obviously over on the other side of the ocean, SME means. Mm -hmm. What is that number to you? Is it less than 500, less than 200, less than a thousand? How do you define that? Sure, sure. I think I would say we have a traditional definition and we have a new definition. So I think if we look at the traditional definition, that's more around like where you were going, employee count. And for us, uh, SMB is anything divide, defined between, below 500 employees. So most okay. of our MSPs are serving customers who have an employee count of less than 500. Maybe the true sweet spot for a lot of MSPs is, you know, that 100, that 50 to 100 sweet spot. So that's kind of what I would say is the traditional type of definition of SMB, but the non or the more modern term that we tend to look at, especially when we talk about partners who are serving end customers who are really focused on cloud and, and SaaS. In this case, we're looking at millions of dollars. So they could be a very small employee company, for example, but be doing millions of dollars in cloud services through a Azure AWS. And so revenue is becoming also another type of metric that we look at beyond employee count, especially when we talk about the cloud and SaaS era. So no, that's uh, fair. That's a good, I mean, it's actually good for everyone to understand that, right? Because, you know, if there's more, it's almost like, hey, before you used to charge per device or per 
physical endpoint, and now you're charging per employee. So it seems like though on the vendor side, revenue is now the true is now turning into the larger you know, wait, if you would, and, you know, it's like your FICO score, right? Hey, you know, like, hey, mm-hmm. if you pay your bills generally on time, your FICO score is pretty good. If you miss a payment, <laughs> it's not going to hurt as much, right? But like, it's now, and now from what your standpoint is, at least at trend, it's, hey, like one man MSP doing $10 million in business, if such a thing exists, like, hey, you're, you're going to be viewed very positively <laughs> than, you know, a 50 man MSP doing $5 million in business, right? So again, I'm throwing crazy numbers out there, but it's worth, you know, it throwing- is possible. I mean, that's what we're seeing. We have some partners that if we classify this MSP as an MSP, that, sorry, as an SMB themselves by employee count. It doesn't really reflect the value they're, <laughs> they're, the revenue they're generating with a small enough amount of people because of the type of services and the type of clients they're serving uh, are, are totally different. So. So, so, so how would you, so it sounds like trend maybe even do more than we, than we know, right? Like I know there's a lot of acronyms being thrown out there, right? Uh, you know, XDR, MDR, mm-hmm. EDR, mm-hmm. SOC, SEAM, all this stuff, right? Like, where do you, where do you actually fit? Like, what is your, if you were to say, here's the 30,000 foot overview of everything we can help, you know, an SMB or an MSP serve a smaller business. What does that look like? Is it just endpoint software or is there more? Uh, definitely. I think this is the, we're one of the best kept secrets, I would say. So uh, some of you see, so the areas I would say we play in for the SMB space, obviously we'll, we'll take out enterprise at the moment, talk about SMB, is really around the XDR conversation. So Trend, we have a plethora of solutions beyond endpoint. And while a lot of our MSPs are really looking at EDR, one of the technologies that they're being introduced to is XDR or extended detection and response. And I'm not sure if the viewers have seen, but the recent Forrester XDR wave just came out in Q2. And guess who is furthest on the right? Trend Micro. Yeah. Oh. And guess who's right there? Our friends over at Microsoft, which we know are a serious security contender uh, in the non-security traditional space, if you will. They're not usually considered a security player, but uh, I, I would beg to differ on that one. So Trend Micro, you can see across various, if you're into the Gartners and the Foresters and the 451 analyst research, were top rated across multiple waves or magic quadrants, whether it's endpoint, whether it's email security, and really where we shine is in cloud security. So protection for Azure, AWS, Office 365, Google Dropbox, these type of platforms are the area. So I think for us, the big one for the SMB space is teaching our partners, A, what XDR is, and B, how they monetize that in the overall stream of what they're doing. And then the second area is, I would say, in SOC as a service or MDR services. So uh, I think we've seen the MSP mind shift on security has shifted, as well as their customers in that it used to be a checkbox security, right, type of mentality. Now it's actually a true business driver for MSPs, but the problem is, have they really gained the security expertise that's required to deliver these high value assets? And so a lot of our, the second area that we're helping our MSPs with is with our co-managed SOC as a service type of offerings where we're augmenting MSPs, existing IT teams to bring security expertise in. And as this co-managed model works, two things. One, they're getting better customer protection proactive going on the offensive in today's sophisticated threats, but also they're learning. I think in this co-managed model, they're able to bring in expertise without having to hire somebody, um, train them up just for them to go to a competitor or maybe we'll as a company. So, pick so, so we got a question that came in that I'll, I'll throw out there in a second, but like, so, j- so what you're saying is instead of going to one of these other guys, right? And there's a, t- a ton of guys out there pushing sock as a service. Trend is actually offering that exact service or similar service. That is correct. For a co, it's, it's we call it co-managed XDR services for MSPs, and the co-managed is a signifier that we are co-working with you, the MSP. The, it's kind of a transparent solution to the end customer because sometimes what happens when MSPs are partnering with MDR providers or SOC providers 
is they're almost removed from the value screen to a degree. Uh, and, we, and with these type of services, it's very important that we keep the MSP in that value screen. So we're kind of on the background, if you will, like um, the end customer will never know that we look like an extension of your team. So the answer is yes, that's probably one of our fastest growing solutions um, beyond like, you know, the EDR, XDR stuff. That's kind of- that, That's prob. I would say it's, you know, that's probably the most sought after conversation for because the majority of what you would call msp sandbox world uh that i like to get called sandbox they just like you said they don't have the manpower the the uh the bandwidth to handle the alert overload from some of these tools and they and even if they did like they just don't understand what they're reading right like <laughs> yeah so, we're seeing that with edr where Partners will adopt EDR. It's what the new buzz is. It's what the cybersecurity companies or insurance companies are saying you need. And then they start getting all the data. Like EDR is just a big collection of, of endpoint telemetry. But then when you're getting all of that, a lot of MSBs are like, well, what do I do now that I have all of this telemetry? And XDR complicates that even more because now you're collecting telemetry from endpoint, email, network, consolidating it all. But then it's still, what do you do with that data? And I think yeah, we're, we're seeing sift, them. Sift, sifting through it is definitely not for um, the novice person who's just trying to figure it out. Like when you thought Windows event logs are, are tough to read, I mean, yeah, like that's down here. We're talking about here. Yeah. But we are uh, tools to, to make, to simplify that with more directed information of like, here's what you do with that information because we realize no one's going to build up security expertise like that right but yeah. it's an important area that a lot of partners are focused on 100 percent. so so brent asked this question i'm going to give it out there as is can you explain why virtually every all, all caps every endpoint vendor which now we know trend micro is more than an endpoint vendor but i'll leave it as is yeah, endpoint yeah. vendor claims that they are the leader in some survey how can we believe you or any other av vendor question mark <laughs> well, my, so I call I, the biggest thing for me is seeing is believing. So there are many competitors that say they have an XDR solution in place. Well, I can tell you, we have an XDR solution. To see it is to believe it. So to see it could be for our MSPs, for example, we believe in a concept called protect your house. We know you're under attack, right? We have a solution called worry free XDR. We will, it's a free 75 NFR license of our XDR solution. So for me, seeing is believing. Come get your hands on our XDR to net technology. Now, the other thing is, yes, analysts, if you're into analysts, again, I mentioned Forrester 451. They're the ones kind of leading the definition of XDR. They're like, you may have heard the term hybrid XDR and the term native XDR. Trend Micro, we have what we call native XDR. As I noted, we have a plethora of products, right? From email to endpoint to cloud. For us, XDR is about how do we connect all of those solutions so that instead of the endpoint sending one alert, the email solution sending another, another XDR is about correlating those two together, right? And so for us, again, the analysts have also confirmed <laughs> that we have an XDR solution in place. Now we see some of our competitors, they're doing what we would call like a hybrid X solution. Maybe they're good on the endpoint, not mention any names, but we know who the, the, in the sandbox, as you call it, who probably is the new endpoint EDR. They're talking about XDR, but maybe they're doing that through integrations so, with third parties. Uh, all right, so let me right. let me rewind. Right, so there are some people in the sandbox that went out into the world, adopted somebody's solution, and then built on top of it to, to deliver their offering. And then that's probably more of the hybrid, right? And then on what we call the native, it's like you're the manufacturer, right? And you've built it, and you've opted to do this on your own instead of, you know, like so somebody could take your stuff and do it, but you're also doing it internally. So that would kind of be the difference between native versus hybrid. Yes. Yeah, that's correct. In this case, you would have trend micro sensors. In the case of XDR, we'll say you would have trend micro sensors across those various security vectors, endpoint network, right? And because it's our data, we know how to correlate it, right? And so we believe. 
we would do a better job of correlating threat data coming from different sources. Now, obviously it's not realistic. For example, most MSPs are pretty tight with their network vendor, right? So if Trend Micro wants network telemetry, we need to play nice to include your network telemetry into our XDR solution. And so we are moving in that direction as well. But I think as far as why we were one of the first ones to XDR market, the reason why was we were able to consolidate our threat data among our products first. That's the easiest thing to do. But now that we've done that, it's okay. Partners like yourself probably have your favorite Sonic wall or you know someone on the end uh, that you, but how do you play nice with Trend? Maybe it's, you're gonna use us for your MDR service, but you wanna keep your sensors in place. And so that's kind of the route that we're kind of moving into uh, now that we currently have a real XDR solution. If you're on Trend products, that's the key on the native side. So big question here is the network is really starting to look different now, right? You know, we've been through the pandemic times, hopefully, hopefully we never hear about lockdowns ever again. Uh, <laughs> sorry for the people in parts of the world that are still in that world. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, hopefully we'll see you soon. Um, how, how do you handle traffic from the home office network or the 4G card or whatever, right? Where it's not a traditional office network anymore. I mean, people are literally working. I you know we we always laughed at the commercials, right? You know, Tony Romo at the beach answering the phone call in the commercial saying, how can I help you or, or mm -hmm. working underneath the umbrella, but like that can actually happen now. Right. So like, how does that, does, you know, can you, can you make sense of that data? Is it a lot of false flags? Like, can you actually do something when you're not in the corporate network? How does that work? Yeah, so I think when I, when, to answer your question, I think obviously through our endpoint, there is technologies where we can get some visibility into the network traffic. For example, in a ransomware attack, usually there's like a, a command, command, and, command and call type of thing that's done, right? To reach out to the internet. Well, that would pass through the endpoint and we could see a command and control type of, from the endpoint, right? But other network traffic, we would be at the home, especially completely blind to. However, I would say one of the ways we're looking, one of the ways we're solving and getting more, I would say more visibility into the home network traffic is through mechanisms like the endpoint. But also if you look at Office 365 itself, that is a network of, I mean, sorry, that is a, a vector of attack, right? There is a lot of data being shared within the Office 365 ecosystem that we are also taking that data and putting that into our XDR engines as well. So we can pick up network information also from like Office 365 and other cloud apps as well using our technologies there. So hmm. unfortunately we're not picking things up off like the home router, like that direct traffic, like a, like a firewall there. That's just, if anyone figures that out, that would be a, a great technology. But I think for us, it's equifinality, different routes to get similar information. So it would be the endpoint or cloud app security, sorry, cloud applications like Office 365, Google, our solutions are tied into there. We're allowed to, well, not allowed, we are, we're able to get information from those ecosystems and then correlate that together. So that's yeah. one way. So you know, our friend Ryan Burton at PAX8 always says, it's a really easy question to help define how far or how not far something goes. So the two questions he said to ask when you're talking about SOC and SIEM and, you know, network monitoring and logs and all this, whatever it is, one, how long is the data held uh, on your side? And two, are you monitoring for just specific things or do you monitor for anything and then begin to filter back once you have that data? So data retention could be based upon customer need. Our standard is 60 days. Um, that would be normally you would use that type of data for threat hunting purposes, right? So 60 days, normally 30 to 60 days is normally if you're talking about for threat hunting purposes. Obviously, certain clients have regulatory issues where they need to store for you know, a year, 460 days those options are, are kind of considered paid options. And that would be more log retention type of approach. 
no one's probably ever going to look at those logs from six months ago that may not be as relevant unless there was an attack that wasn't discovered for six months, then maybe someone's going to look at those. Most of that uh, I find is more just to check off the regulatory button versus actually using the data. Like 60 days usually is going to be actionable data that actually 30 days or less is probably going to be the most actionable data. But again, again, get a regulatory compliance. There are those options um, that the customer would have if they need those those type of things but trend for example we probably won't be looking at that data only retaining it uh greater than 60 days no it makes sense and then like on the sock seam like hey how much data are you collecting are you collecting from anything and everything and then from there do you start doing your your sifting through or are you only looking for specific things and you're kind of like not even you know like you don't even import the other stuff no, so I think the concept of XDR is to collect everything, correlate, and what comes out of the correlation equals the most important thing you should focus on, take action on, for example. Like I think about, you know, some people when, when they hear XDR, they think, well, isn't that what a sim is supposed to do, right? Correlate all the, well, in theory, yes, but what XDR does is, is actually the layer before going to the sim. So XDR is all about collect everything, metadata, detection data, but also to collect it from other sources, put all your fancy words, machine learning, normalization, all those words, you know, and then the output of that trend micro, we call those noteworthy events. So like a noteworthy event, maybe if it was one event on itself, it, going to the sim, it wouldn't be very you know noticeable. But when we correlate it, something that was benign on itself, has more context. And so XDR actually works with SIM because what we're sending to a SIM is more high fidelity, more, it's already correlated already. It can get stand out for the SOC analyst to do something that they already have a lot more context on. And so on our, our approach is collect everything in the cloud, of course, <laughs> um, normalize it, all the words, and then the output of that is is the value of like XDR, for example. Awesome. All, all good information there. So like, I think one of the struggles um, is just, number one, w like we, we're hearing, hey, it could be 10, 20, 40 different things plugged into your layered security approach, mm -hmm. which in some cases is more than the actual managed, you know, services package, right, of things that have been brought together. And then the other, you know, you know, coming off of that thought is how do how does the managed services company properly figure out the price point in which their end customer would reasonably pay, right? Like if you go to your customer and say, hey, miss, I'm just gonna put out fictitious numbers here. Hey, we're charging you um $2,500 a month for everything we're doing for you now, right? But we're going to need another $3,000 a month on top of the $2,500 a month in order to now deliver you security uh, in any real way. I would say that that's probably not going to get approved. <laughs> I okay. Would so, so, so again, like obviously the larger the customer, the more willing and, you know, obviously the more dollars there are potentially to invest in the security topic. But if you're talking about a, Let's even go below 50, man, right? You said 50 to 100, sweet spot. Let's say it's 10 to 25, right? Like, let's say it's 15, right? We'll pick a number in between. Like, what is reasonable in your opinion? What are you seeing from people that you're talking to on the street saying, yeah, I can easily go and say, hey, I need an extra $50 per employee, $100 per employee, uh, X, and you know, however they're packaging it together. What is the, what is the sweet spot that, you know, like, listen, there's no, by the way, I'll, I'll be the 80th person you've heard from, hopefully more. There is no guarantee, right? Security is a moving target. And if the government with all of their money and these bigger entities with all of their money can't, you know, protect themselves that a hundred percent, there is no hundred percent, right? We get that. We're just lowering the risk possibility. Okay. So let's just make that clear. But, you know, how, you know, what is the price point, the reasonable price point for a small business to get to lower the risk point by 50%, 60, 70%. Like, like where does that needle go versus what dollar amount is required? 
Yeah, maybe before I answer that, what I see is MSPs that are being successful with taking their customers, what I would call from baseline security to more advanced. The big difference I see between those partners and those that are struggling is how they describe their security services to their end customers. So a lot of MSPs have, have their customer believing that their cybersecurity is already covered in the price they're paying today. And so the customer doesn't realize what I have and what I'm paying for is different than probably where you need to be, right? The customer is underneath the impression, I'm already paying for security. So when the partner comes back and says, no, I need you to buy this, add this EDR or add this MDR or add this cybersecurity awareness training, the customer is confused and saying, aren't I already paying for that? So the first thing I see is the partners that are being successful, they've done a great job of creating that line between what the customer is getting today and what the customer should have. So that it's clear to the customer, right? The second piece of your question is more, the answer is more of that dollar amount. And I think it really just depends on what is that customer's appetite for risk mitigation. For example, if the customer is looking at cybersecurity insurance, you know they have an appetite to protect their business. Well, well I'm gonna hold I'm gonna pause you for a second. I feel like I mean the way I've explained cybersecurity insurance is this is the last part of your plan. This is the safety net in case everything else fails, right? Like it made it through, none of your roadblocks slowed them down. They got to your system, you had a pain, and now you're now using the last, you know, I call it the emergency lever, right, on the train to, to do something because there's nothing else underneath of that. However, as many people have pointed out, and it's worth pointing out now, even the insurance companies have said, hey, these claims are getting serious, and they're fast, and they're furious, and like we're going to start picking apart these claims to make sure that you did what you should have done. You did your reasonable efforts or whatever the terminology is that they're using. And, and some of them have absolutely defined that, right? Like we've heard earlier in the year, uh, travelers came out and said, if you're not doing multi-factor authentication, we're dropping the policy, right? Yeah. Forget so it. Don't even buy point. it, right? That's my point there in that those customers, they want that policy. And so cyber security insurance and MSPs are, MSPs are in the middle of the attestation of, of that process, right? And so MSPs who are being successful in convincing the customer are using cybersecurity insurance as a way to say, you have to have these advanced technologies, EDR, multi-factor. And so the MSP is then increasing their MRR with that customer by using that. So they're not scaring them. It's a risk mitigation strategy, if you will. And they're part of that. So um, that's what I would say. I would say as far as a dollar amount, it really depends, right? Like the more regulated the customer, they probably have budget already, even if they're a small bank, for example, there's budget for these and they're usually mandated. So that conversation is usually easier in their appetite. But I would say like some small, we had a small vet clinics, like this one MSP manages thousands of small vet clinics and they're one to three employee shops. I will admit that was a harder discussion because when you start talking about services like MDR and XDR, what the customer sees, it's hard for them to, to get the value. So the bar is a lot higher to prove value to the customer. So if you're gonna raise the cost by greater than, I would say 15%, then the burden of you showing value of like, well, I'm paying for your sock services. I haven't had an incident in six months. Well, that's actually a good thing, but the customer is like, what am I paying for, right? Like, you know, I haven't saw an incident report in six months, la, la, la. So these high value services like SOC and MDR, they're actually more difficult for the customer to see the value. And that's one of the areas we're trying to talk to MSPs because normally we would sell the MSP on our solution and say, hey, you go package it up and go to market. But what we're finding now is MSPs understand these advanced technologies and they're starting to understand how to monetize it. And they're asking for our help to say, help me talk to my customer about the value of EDR, the value of SOC as a service. And honestly, 
That's where I, I'm I, struggling. We're struggling. Well, I, I mean, it. a lot of people are afraid to put their, their information out there because obviously the internet lives forever. Uh, but you almost need to work backwards from the people that have had a problem, right? You know, like, Jesus. I mean, obviously in MSP land, like I say, solar winds, I say, Kase, and everybody understands like, Hey, these things have happened recently. Right. Um, not, to, not to the fault of those vendors per se. I'm not pointing a bazooka at them, but like it happened and they were in the middle. Right. So, you know, the rest will shake out when it does. Uh, at the end of the day, like if, you know, it's like, Hey, let's say you had a customer who got spoofed and they fell for the guy uh, who or girl who was sending that message, the bad person, and they wired two hundred thousand dollars to a bank account that they thought was a vendor, but turned out to be somebody who was just swindling them, right? Mm-hmm. Like that happens oh, every day. Or or the people who have legitimately had uh, an event where you know they had a crypto or a ransom uh, to pay, and were they able to recover? Did they pay the ransom? Didn't they? What did they do? What did their insurance company do? Like sometimes, you know, like I was always, you know, on, on uh, when I was growing up, it's like you can learn the hard way yourself or you can learn from somebody else or you could do both. I think this is a time we start learning from the people that have had problems. The problem is, are they willing to share? Because <laughs> we can we can theorize all day long about how and where and when. But then when you see it actually happening, you know, from what I gather, a lot of the things that have happened haven't been so sophisticated that they hacked the firewall and figured out like it it really came down to just a human being doing something they shouldn't have been doing yeah i I agree with all that sentiment i think cybersecurity sometimes is all about the technology but it's that's a piece of it there's the human element and that's that x element that i think is across (laughs) uh the the whole cybersecurity uh space right now is that human piece whether it's protecting or, you know, even knowing what's going on, I think the human element of cybersecurity is always that X factor that uh, you can't predict uh, at all. But yeah, well, I, I I was on a panel in Las Vegas um, about the future of cybersecurity, and there's a bunch of people in there that are cybersecurity, you know, experts, and they have products and like their things do things, and I just came from from the outside perspective, and I'm just like. Listen, guys, I mean, I'm sure all of the stuff that you say you're selling works, and that's great. I was like, my problem is getting the message to the end customer, right? The guy who's running a bakery, an insurance brokerage, uh, an accounting firm, uh, a small law practice. Like, this is, I'm out of business stuff, right? Like, they may never come back where a bigger company, you know, can you know lose some money and, and, and move on, right? Like, these guys may never turn the lights back on kind of thing. And I think- while that may be the worst part of this of the spectrum, um, it's not outrageous to put that theory out there, right? It's happening. No, no, no. You said earlier, uh, customers sometimes have to learn the hard way. I will say this: we've seen the adoption of an advanced security solution come very easily and very quickly post the breach. Um, and normally, for me, this. While I don't like to see breaches, this is an opportunity for vendors like us. When one of our customers is in the midst of the breach for our our, 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 our IR team, <laughs> our incident response team to go in there. And at that point, trend, we, 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 we call it trend cares. We're honestly there to help them, honestly. But what comes out of building that relationship is okay, this could have been maybe prevented, maybe, again, there's nothing 100%, but you would have been in a better position to respond and be more resilient uh, and you're, you would have had less company impact with these type of solutions. So it's again with those customers, talking to those customers about risk mitigation, the cost of a breach, if you have a breach, could be also mitigated with these advanced services. That's another message that I'm hearing is, well, what would be the cost of an actual breach if these type of, let's say, MDR services were, instead of being able to respond in an hour, it took you five days a week to respond. Well, that's going to impact your business a lot more expensive than, you know, paying the extra five dollars a month or whatever uh, per user. So uh, I think it's still a struggle just because cybersecurity, in my view, has gotten a lot more complicated 
that the customer maybe will tune it out, even though they see on the news every other week a ransomware attack. They don't think it will happen to them, maybe because they're in the small business. But I think actually most ransomware attacks happen to like companies like 11 to, I don't know, like 50 or something. So they're the ones keeping the ransomware uh, business up and running. It's not the enterprises. Those are the ones that make the news. It's the small businesses are the ones that are being under attack because they don't have the facilities. A hundred percent. And, and a lot of people, my, myself included, I've asked the question, um, if the federal government and these government agencies are in the middle of some of these larger situations, like it doesn't seem up until this point that they've been able to push back, right? Like they're supposed to be kind of like help, you know, the last line, right? You don't expect uncle Sam to come in and help you in your cyber situation, but I mean, they're supposed to be there and it just doesn't seem like they've been successfully able to discourage the bad guys uh, to a large degree to like slow down. Uh, we saw that with the pipeline attack. We saw that with, um, you know, a bunch of the stuff, including Kaseya. I know that they're in the middle of Kaseya thing. So, um, and then they turn around, right? And instead of at least us being able to visibly see that they're able to fight back on the other side, the bazooka and the cannon has been turned back on the small business, the government entity, what have you. And, and so there, while it's not been passed, there is a Senate bill, which has been introduced. Uh, I forget which senator uh, or senators have, have you know, kind of signed off on it to, to put it out there. But uh, basically, they're like, listen, if you're 50 employees or above, which Most. I would say is a large portion of what you would consider SMB, um, or, and if you're, whether that's a nonprofit, for-profit, uh, state, local government, whatever, um, you have 72 hours to report your ransomware and or uh, crypto payment and or whatever it is event um, or the penalty uh, could be, and again, not approved yet, but suggested uh, 0.5% of gross revenue annually, right? So, you know, that's a, that, you know, if you're a million dollars, if you're a hundred thousand dollars, 0.5%, half a percent, you know, that that's a real number. Uh, obviously the bigger you are, the more expensive it is, but that seems like they're pointing their efforts in the wrong direction, right? Like, okay, you have agencies out there to fight the bad guys, but so basically you're, you're forcing re to re you know, people to report with the idea that you're going to get more information in front of those fighting agencies, but like, where have you actually been successfully able to help, right? I'm not seeing it. I'm not trying to blame anyone. I'm just talking right. from, from what everybody sees. So like, hmm. it kind of sounds like, you know, you know, don't expect help. You're not going to get it, in my opinion. You're not going to get it. But oh, by the way, if you don't report it, you're going to get doubly hurt, right? <laughs> so, yeah, I think the intentions, you know, I'm not, I'm not a big politics person, but I'm aware of kind of what you said there. I think the attention probably is to increase the transparency in these breaches. And I think you talked about it earlier in the, the customer conversation, like those customers have been breached. Most of the time they want to keep that a secret, right? And so it's like this ransomware epidemic, I hate that word now, is a result of the lack of transparency on how rampant this really is. Obviously, Trend, we can see a lot from just our customer base, and we know how rampant and uh, you know next gen ransomware is. But I think overall, from a governmental perspective, the government maybe doesn't have the transparency that they feel they need. Uh, and whether this is approach is the right way to increase that transparency, I'm not quite sure uh, about that as being the way. But I do believe we need more transparency as it relates to these breaches. And I think about at the beginning of the coronavirus as an example, I personally, like if I would have contracted Corona in that early stage, like what I've been telling everybody, like I even kind of felt like it was not a good thing, but you know, actually I contracted coronavirus, I don't know, a month or two ago was rather ill. And it was, I felt okay to tell folks that that is and i think with ransomware it's still not okay to to tell hey i was breach and i did everything i could and have that vulnerability uh aspect that comes with being breached right and i think when i look at the case and all of those situations i don't i'm not pointing fingers that could happen to trend micro we're in the middle of 
all of these customers as well. And so breaches, I think, unfortunately, is an unfortunate reality. And so that transparency there. So to your comments there about the government, my view is, are they trying to get more transparency? Is this the best way? Probably not. But I think we do need more transparency when there are breaches. Um, yeah. Think, uh, well, I mean, big picture, right? The other thing that's come out of this, again, government conversation is, you know, well, two things. There's private sector, right? You had, uh, which I was told has since been rescinded, but I'm going to put it out there anyway. All state going out to their agencies saying, if you have an MSP and those MSPs are using these RMM style products, remove them immediately. And I'm like, whoa. Right. So that's number one. Right. Now they've since rescinded that, but like that went wide. And then number two, it's, you know, like the, the statement, you know, from the CISO, CISO agency saying, Hey, if you're using an MSP, here are the things that you should be concerned with that they themselves could be an attack vector. And you should ask yourself if you should be using an MSP and I'm like, wait a minute, (laughs) hold on a second. Like, that's not, that's not the actual message. I hope that's not the message. The message should be, here are the things that are happening out in the world. And if you are using an outside versus internal, because what else is there? Here are the things that need to be covered in order to start putting some sensibility into what you should be doing. But that's not how the messaging came out. So as, a, as the sandbox, as the sub-vertical MSP industry, IT services industry is concerned, there needs, it sounds like there needs to be a off, uh, offensive messaging coming from our sandbox saying, hey, listen, we're not the problem. We need to be part of the solution, but there's a two-way street in order to get there. And you can't just not take recommendations and then leave us in the middle of holding the bag kind of thing. Yeah, I think the, the threat actors put MSPs under the spotlight. And this has been coming for like, what? this is not, you know, because saying those are the recent ones, but I remember even ConnectWise a couple of years ago had some coding issues. So uh, I think early on the threat actors realized the lucrativeness of targeting MSPs. And um, now, you know, it put, put a lot of companies under the spotlight, whether it's government regulation, those type of things, so cybersecurity insurance companies, I think they were, they lost a lot of money last year. And so, you know, they're scrambling, pointing fingers, things like that as well, I think as well. But uh, I think Datto had a good survey I saw recently. It was like uh, 98% of MSP said, now's a great time to be an MSP. Uh, and I still believe in that sentiment uh, right now that even though there is, it's a good thing that there's some spotlight on MSPs. Like I've been, you've been in the industry probably a long time uh, as I have. And I feel like right now is like, if, if I was going to quit Trend Micro, I'm starting an MSP because this is the time. Now, I'm sure a lot of your, uh, you know, there's a lot of competition. Everyone's claiming this MSP flag, and maybe that's why these insurance companies are coming out with some of those things. But I think overall, it's a good thing that MSPs are under the spotlight. There's a lot of support that we as Trend and other vendors, I think the cybersecurity industry is really focused on MSPs. You've seen a lot of new players come up with dedicated MSP messaging, right? And so I think it's a good time uh, and it's a great opportunity actually right now to, to use cybersecurity to, to grow the business versus just being you know, a checkbox as it was in the past. So. So, so Brent comes back and says, does anyone admit that they were one, compromised, two, infected, three, robbed, Four insulted, whatever question mark. I don't run around announcing things that make me look bad. Hey, Brent, not disagreeing with that at all. But if you have a customer that was negatively affected, that real world example, right? Not hypothetical, but that real world example could be part of your messaging to your other customers to say, hey, listen, this guy thought he was a really smart guy and he is. And like, he's a guy that signs all the checks and transfers all the money, but like, he even got fooled, right? And he'll admit that. Like, don't, you know, use that as your building block to say, don't let this happen to you. It can even get the best of us. These are the things that you can do right now, today, to prevent that story, right? I mean, you don't like. There's a balance. I, I, like, I mean, you have to be vulnerable to, I think, transparency. There is that vulnerable, you're vulnerable to a degree because you are 
almost admitting some culpability in that. So for example, anytime one of our customers is impacted and our IRT, we feel bad about this. Like, um, and sure, do I wanna tell another customer uh, that, that one of our customer was breached? Probably we don't wanna say that, but these are the facts. And I think it's better to be transparent uh, than to say, you know, we're good at 100%, and, or, you know, like, we, there is that balance. Yes, I do believe we have strong technology and it's proven by third parties, but at the same time, it's not 100%. And when things happen, we have to be transparent about those. Even on trend side, I think that, that we, we saw some of that whenever some of our apps got taken down from Apple two or three years ago, right? It's about when there's vulnerabilities in some of our products, I think ConnectWise got slapped on the hand a couple of years ago because of that lack of transparency. And so I think transparency is still important, but yes, there is a balance like Brent said between, yeah, I don't want to go tell my, everyone I was robbed or something like that. There's that balance between that. Brent does come back and says, totally understand and agree, but I cannot convince a customer to report. Hey, Brent, some of the, you're, you're hundred percent right. You can't force them, but you have some things that you have to do and be, as being somebody in the middle, right? Like, there are laws in place. There are compliances in place. Like even your insurance company may require you to report an incident in order to maintain coverage, right? So certain things you are responsible for. And then ultimately the customer is responsible for their part, whether they don't do that or not, like that's not your responsibility. And so, so, so important to stipulate this in your MSA, right? Because the last thing you want to do is open more liability up to you, the service provider, because your end customer refuses to do stuff. We hear this all the time about, hey, they, I gave them a recommendation. I explained they needed to do something. They opted not to. And I had them write, fill out a document saying, I was told, I agree that I chose not to do this. I declined, whatever. Like your MSA is your, uh, I, Brad Grosso says, constitution, right? Like it needs to be made really clear up front that you can't break laws as part of your contractual relationship with the customer, right? You need to be okay when it's all said and done. So you won't facilitate that uh and here's what you are and are not responsible for and then like the rest is really you know like i'm going to advise you to the best of my ability and it's really ultimately your job as the end customer to comply with your situation right do they have to no will there be consequences maybe but like those consequences shouldn't bleed onto your desk and you need to protect your house like they need to protect theirs right I always say MSPs are in the business of assuming client risk. Like that's the business of an MSP, the highest level. You're assuming risk. And so some of these technologies, what I'm seeing as well is some MSPs are adopting, adopting them to diversify the risk they're assuming for their customer. So maybe their all their customers are not going to adopt these advanced solutions, but if enough do, they'll cover the ones that don't actually pay them because it diversifies the MSP risk. Uh, or, or, or you make a decision, Brent, that, you know, if the liability is too high to continue doing business, I, I would hate to even say turn down business, but if it's going to open up a very bad door for you, should an event happen because your customer is just unwilling or unable, the question ultimately falls down to you. Do I want to continue doing this? Because it could hurt you in the end more than whatever the revenue that you're making from it, right? I mean, like, that's the real, you know, like, imagine, hypothetical, nobody's ever told me this story, but this is the problem, hypothetical. I'm going to throw it out there anyway. But it's a, a realistic one, unless LG tells me otherwise. <laughs> um, let's say the customer has this insurance policy, right? They, they got the cybersecurity, was part of their business liability, blah, blah, blah. They, they have an incident, they put it in a claim, their insurance company sends in an incident response team person, guy, whatever, specialist. They come in, they start sifting through the situation. They come back and they're like, yeah, we're not going to prove this claim because this, 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 and this didn't happen, right? MFA wasn't turned on. So password rotation wasn't happening. This, this you know, like this, the, just generic hygiene stuff, right? Uh, you weren't disabling user accounts as they were leaving the business and they were left open, stuff like that, right? And, they, and then the end customer turns around and says, well, that's all this guy's responsibility over here. So not only are they fighting the insurance company saying, you didn't pay out my whatever claim, put a dollar amount to it. Now they turn around and sue you as the MSP for that claim amount, saying that you were the reason 
that they they weren't able to file the claim. So now you should pay the claim out. Um, I haven't heard that officially as being a use case. Well, well, well hold on, hold on. <laughs> Not seems- quite exactly that way, but there was, I believe, I, I just saw the article this week. Uh, I have to go back and dig it out of my, my RSS feed. An end customer clicked on a link and created a breach. And so literally they admitted, hey, the person between the, key, the seat and the keyboard at the end customer did the damage. They turn around and sued the MSP for one two one two million dollars because that person clicked on that link, and we're like, well, wait a minute. Yes. You admitted to doing the you, know, you left the door open. Somebody walked through and robbed you. Okay, why is that my fault? Oh well, the lock the lock was faulty. Yeah. Doesn't matter. You left the door open. <laughs> lock didn't you have a chance to do his job? Oh, but we're still suing you. I mean, it's America. Anybody can sue anybody for anything. So like, that's a real world example of where the MSP is like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> um, you clicked on the link. You admitted to clicking on the link. Why is this my fault? Well, because you're the IT company. You told me I shouldn't be having a problem. Yeah, yeah. Again, MSPs are in the middle of assuming client risk. So cybersecurity, to me, has created that opportunity where with their ill-equipped kind of IT staffs at a lot of MSPs, as it relates to cybersecurity, the inability to do 24 by 7 cybersecurity operations, this has actually created more risk for MSPs that they're assuming if well, they're we see we see the bad guys like to, to strike on on the holiday weekends for sure yes every holiday I, i'm always wondering am i going to be part of the ir we have a team channel for these events that we uh pick up and yeah my last one was kaseya because i'm mostly obviously involved with msp but you know trend where we, we have ir responses every day it's crazy but yeah in general you know, it's a good time to be an MSP, but also I, I see there's a lot more risk as it relates to cybersecurity that MSPs are assuming or looking to diversify and mitigate through technology, through working with MDR providers. These are all mechanisms that not only the customer may be looking at, but the benefit is so is the MSP. If those two come together, that's where I see the opportunity for MSPs is when, when they come together there. 100%. So... LG, where do people find out more about all this stuff that they had no clue uh, yeah, that your so company apparently does? <laughs> trendmicro.com forward slash MSP is to learn specifically about our MSP uh, story uh, as it relates to the SMB story would be the, the best place to go. Um, definitely reach out to MSP at trendmicro.com uh, is another good email location or hit me up on LinkedIn. I can get you in contact with myself or some of my team members who support MSPs. Just just type in LG in the Google, it'll come right on up. <laughs> Life's good. <laughs> exactly. No, I I, I really uh, I really appreciate the uh, the conversation. I think that you know everybody can learn a little bit about you know in every one of these sessions, or just you know by talking to other people in the industry. So we learn things uh, by coming out of the bubble, right? And like get out of the garage and out of the basement and like get out of the sandbox. Play yeah. on the swing set. It's there okay. you go. There you <laughs> go. So this. So really appreciate your time. This session was 100% recorded. You'll see it posted online at mspinitiative.com under sessions, as well as all of our other sessions and all of our future sessions, by the way. Just stick them all right there so you know where to get them. Uh, Brent, thanks for, for chiming in. We, we always love your questions. They're, they're fantastic. And uh, uh, LG will be connecting shortly after this call uh, about another topic, but you may, you may be able to run into LG's team on the street before the end of the year. If not, hit them up online. And they'll get you in the right place, but worth checking it out. This is one of the manufacturer side programs. And there's really a handful that I can think of, whereas third parties, you know, are, you know, have adopted multiple vendors to try and smash them together into kind of an external program. This is the reverse of that. So definitely worth at least looking for a little bit of information on how that would look. Well, um, congratulations on MSP initiative. Been following what you, what your team is doing. there, doing some awesome work uh, for the MSP movement. So congratulations on, over one year of content creation. Uh, that's difficult to continue that. So congratulations. Well, but when you have people like KP, you know, it's, <laughs> it's a little bit easier than you think, but it's a, it's all good. Uh, thank you very much for that. We're going to continue these every Tuesdays and Thursdays, one o'clock Eastern time. Again, hopefully we'll see you guys in person before the end of the year. If not, stay tuned here and we'll have LG back uh, soon, right? And we'll continue the conversation and kind of expand in other areas. Excellent. Well, take care, George. Everyone have a great day. Bye-bye. See ya.